two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our seed. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Whose misadventures hideous overthrows, dooms death to bury their parents' strife. The fearful of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage. The which if you patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not, but be sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's a Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo doth thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. Is there no pity sitting in the clouds that sees into the bottom of my grief? Oh, sweet, my mother, cast me not away. Delay this marriage for a month, a week. Or, if you do not, make the bridal bed in that dim monument where Tybalt lies. Oh, God, oh, nurse, how shall this be prevented? My husband is on earth, my faith in heaven. How shall that faith return again to earth unless that husband sent it me from heaven by leaving earth? Comfort me, counsel me. Alack, alack, that heaven should practice such stratagems upon so soft a subject as myself. What sayest thou? Hast thou not a word of joy? Some comfort, nurse. Farewell. God knows when we shall meet again. I have a faint, cold fear thrills through my veins that almost freezes up the heat of life. I'll call them back again to comfort me. Nurse! What should she do here? My dismal scene I needs must act alone. Come, vile. What if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married then tomorrow morning? No, no. This shall prevent it. I thou there. What if it be a poison which the friar hath subtly ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage he should be dishonored because he married me before to Romeo? I fear it is. Yet, we think it should not, for we have still been tried a holy man. How if, when I am laid into the tomb, I wait before the time that Romeo comes to redeem me? There's a fearful Shall I not then lie stifled in the vault to whose foul mouth no help some air breathes in? And there die strangled ere my Romeo comes? Oh, if I wake, shall I not be distraught and violent with all these hideous fears and madly play with my forefather's joints and pluck the mangled tybalt from a shroud and with some great kinsman's bone as with the club dash out my desperate brains? Romeo, I come. This do I drink to thee? We are three queens whose sovereigns fell before the wrath of cruel Creon, who endured the beaks of ravens, talents of the kites, and pecks of crows in the foul fields of Thebes. He will not suffer us to bum their bones, to earn their ashes, 
nor to take the fence of mortal loathsomeness from the blessed eye of holy Phoebus, but infects the winds with stench of our slain lords. O oh, pity, Duke, thou perjurer of the earth, draw thy feared sword that does good turns to the world. Give us the bones of our dead kings that we may chapel them. And of thy boundless goodness, take some note that for our crowned heads, we have no roof, save that which is the lions and the bears and vault to everything. Honored Hippolyta, most dreaded Amazonian, that hast slain the sky the tusk bore, that with thy arm, as strong as it is white, was near to make the male to thy sex captive. But that this thy lord, born to uphold creation, that honor first nature stouted in, shrunk thee into the bound that was o'erflowing, at once subduing thy force in thy affection. Dear soldieress, that equally canst poise sternness with pity, whom now I know hast much more power on him than ever he had on thee, who owes his strength and his love too, who is a servant for the tenor of thy speech. Dear glass of ladies, bid him that we whom flaming war doth scorch under the shadow of his sword may cool us, Require him he advance it o'er our heads. Speak it in a woman's key, like such a woman as any of us three weep ere you fail. Lend us a knee, but touch the ground for us no longer time than a dove's motion when the head's plucked off. Tell him if he in the blood-sized field lay swollen, showing the sun his teeth, grinning at the moon, what you would do. Why should I love this gentleman? Tis odds he never will affect me. I am base, and he a prince. To marry him is hopeless, and to be as a whore is witless. Oh, out upon it! What pushes are we wenches driven to when fifteen once has found us? First I saw him, next I pitied him, and then I loved him. Extremely loved him, infinitely loved him. And yet he had a cousin, and fair is he too. <laughs> Oh, but in my heart was Palamon, and once he kissed me, and I loved my lips the better ten days after. Oh, would he would do so every day. What should I do to make him know I love him, or I would fain enjoy him? <laughs> Say I ventured to set him free. What says the law then? Thus much for law or kindred, I will do it. And this night or tomorrow, he shall love me. <laughs> when shall we three meet again and thunder lightning on rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That will be air in the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet this, Macbeth. I come, Grey Malkin. Paddock calls. Anon. Fair is foul and foul is fair. fair. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap, and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I, avoid thee, witch, the rump fed runyon cries. Her husband to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger. 
the innocent, I'll slither sail. And like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. I'll give thee a wind. Fart time. And I another. I myself have all the other. Look at what I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a sailor's thumb, drafted homeward he did come. A thrum, a thrum, Macbeth doth hum. The weird sister, hand in hand, hand. hosts of the sea and, and land. Thus do you go, go about, about the fowl, thrice to die, and thrice to die, and thrice to die, and thrice to die, and thrice to die. Peace! The charm is wound up. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou how would thou esteemest the ornament of life and live a coward in thine own esteem? Letting I dare not rest upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be much more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They had made themselves, and their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck. And I know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from its boneless gums and dashed its brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. Round about the cauldron glow, and the poison entrails grow, till the under cold stone, days and nights has thirty one. Sweltered venom sleeping got, loyal vow first in the charmed pot. Double, 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 double toil double and trouble, fire, burn, cauldron, bubble. Fillet of a fenny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. I am newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing, for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble, double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron double. Scale of dragon tooth of wolf. Vitch's mummy, maw, and gulf of the raven sea salt shark, root of hemlock digged in the dark, liver of a blaspheming Jew, gall of goat and slips of you, silvered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk and Tartar's lips, finger of birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab, make the gruel thick and slab as there to a tiger's chaudron, for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, 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 toil and, and trouble. trouble. Fire, 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 his mansion and his titles in a place from whence himself does fly? He loves us not. He wants the natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds will fight, her young ones in her nest against the owl. All is the fear and nothing is the love. As little is the wisdom for the flight, so runs against all reason. Sirrah, your father's dead. What will you do now? How will you live? As birds do, mother. 
What? With worms and flies? With what I get, I mean. And so do they. Ooh, poor bird. <laughs> Thou'd never fear the net nor lime, the pitfall nor the gin. Why should I, mother? Poor birds they are not set for. My father is not dead. All you're saying. Yes, he is dead. But how wilt thou do for a father? Nay, how will you do for a husband? Why, I can buy me twenty at any market. <laughs> Was my father a traitor, mother? Aye, that he was. What is a traitor? Why, one that swears and lies. And be all traitors that do so? Everyone that does so is a traitor and must be hanged. Who must hang them? Why, the honest men. Then the liars and swearers are fools, for there are liars and swearers, and now to beat the honest men, hang up them. Now, God help thee, poor monkey. <laughs> but how wilt thou do for a father? If he were dead, you'd weep for him. If you would not, then it would be a good sign that I should quickly have new father. Poor Prattler, how thou talkst. Whither should I fly? I have done no harm. But I remember now, I am in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable. To do good sometimes accounted dangerous folly. Why then, alas, do I put up that womanly defense to say I have done no harm? I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Since his majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, and take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed, all this while in the most fast sleep. A great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. Lo you, here she comes. This is her very guise, and upon my life fast asleep. Observe her, stand close. What is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her, to seem thus washing her hands. I've known her to continue in this a quarter of an hour. Yet, here's a spot. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out, Spot, out, I say! One, two, why then, tis time to do it. Fie, my lord, fie, a soldier and a feared. What need we fear who knows it? Yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Do you mark that? The Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? What will these hands ne'er be clean? No more of that, my lord, no more of that. You mar with all this starting. Go to, go to, you have known what you should not. She has spoke what she should not, I am sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. Yet here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh, oh, oh. What a sigh is there. The heart is sorely charged. I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. To bed, to bed. There's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 come. Give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. Will she go now to bed? Directly. Foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. I think, but dare not speak. Good night, good doctor.
shall we go? To seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. Alas, what danger will it be to us, maids as we are to travel forth so far? Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire, and with a kind of umber smirch my face, the likes do you. So shall we pass along and never stir assailants? Were it not better, because that I am more than common tall, that I did suit me all other points like a man, a gallant curdle axe upon my thigh, a boar spear in my hand and in my heart, lie there what hidden women spear their will. We'll have a swashing in martial outside, as many other managed cowards have, and do outface it with their semblances. What shall I call thee when thou art a man? I'll have no worse a name than Joe's own page. Therefore, look, you call me Ganymede, but what will you be called? Something that hath a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but Alina. But cousin, what if we essayed to steal that clownish fool out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to our travel? He'll go along o'er the wide world with me, leave me alone to woo him. Let's away and get our jewels and our wealth together. Devise the fittest time and safest way to hide us from the pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now go we in content to liberty and not to banishment. Think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy. And yet he speaks well. But what care I for words? Yet words do well when he who speaks them pleases those who hear. He is a pretty youth, not very pretty, and sure he's proud, but his pride becomes him. He's not very tall, but for his years he is tall. His leg is but so-so, and yet tis well. There was a little redness in his lip. It was a little riper and more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. It made just the difference between the constant red and the mingled damask. There be some women, Silvius, who had they marked upon him in parcels as I did, would have got so near to fall in love with him. For my part, I love him not, though I hate him not. And yet I have more cause to hate him than to love him. For what had he do to chide at me? He said, mine eyes were black and mine hair was black. And now I remember he scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again. But that's all one. I will write him a very taunting letter. And thou shalt bear it. Wilt thou, Silvius? <laughs> It is not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, but it is no more unhandsome to see the lord the epilogue. If it be true that good wine needs no bush, then a good play needs no epilogue, but to good wine they do use good bushes, and good plays prove the better by the help of good epilogues. What a case am I in, then, that am neither a good epilogue nor cannot insinuate with you in the behalf of a good play? I am not furnished like a beggar. Therefore, to beg will not become me. My way is to conjure you, and I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O men, for the love you bear to women, and I perceive by your simpering that none of you hates them, that between you and the women, the play may please. As I am a woman, I will kiss as many of you as have beard that please me, complexions that like me, and breath that I defy not. And I am sure as many of you as have good beards or good faces or sweet breath will, for my kind offer, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell. <laughs> My lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all embraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, ungartered and down jived to his ankles, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other. And with a look so piteous and perfect as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors, he comes before me. 
He grabbed me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm, and with his hand thus o'er his brow, he falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it. Long stayed he so. At last a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it seemed to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets me go, and with his head thus o'er his shoulder, he seemed to find his way without his eyes. For out of doors he went without their help, and to the last, bended their light on me. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus, but use all gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor, suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature, for anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as it were, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. So many journeys may the sun and moon make us again count or in love be done. But woe is me, you are so sick of late, so far from cheer and from your former state that I distrust you. Yet though I distrust, discomfort you, my lord, if nothing must. For women's fear in love holds quantity in neither aught or in extremity. Now what my love is, proof hath made you know, and as my love is size, my fear is so. Where love is great, the littlest doubts are fear. Where little fears grow great, great love grows there. Where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? How now, Ophelia? How should I your true love know from another one? By his cockle hat and staff and his sandals shoon. Alas, sweet lady, what imports this song? Say you, nay, pray you, mark. He is dead and gone, lady. He is dead and gone. At his head a grass green turf, at his heels a stone. Nay, but Ophelia. Pray you, mark. White his shroud as the mountain snow. Alas, look here, my lord. Parted with sweet flowers. Which he went to the grave did go with true love showers. How do you, pretty lady? Well, God ill do. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. God be at your table. Conceit upon her father. Pray you, let's have no words of this. But when they ask you what it means, say you this. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning be time, and I am made at your window to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes and up the chamber door, let in a maid, then out a maid, never departed more. Pretty Ophelia. Indeed, law without an oath, I'll make an end on't. By just and St. Charity, alack and fie for shame, Young men will doubt if they come taught by cock they are to blame. Old she before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. So would I have done by yonder sun, and thou hadst not come to my bed. How long hath she been thus? I hope all will be well. We must be patient. 
but I cannot choose but to weep to think that they should lay him in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it. And so I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Follow her close. Give her good watch, I pray you. Are we all met? Pat, Pat, and here's a convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage. This Hawthorne break our tiring house, and we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How answer you that? A parlous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a wit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue, and let the prologue seem to say that we will not do harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And for a more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue, and it shall be written in eight and six. Will not the ladies be afraid of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in God shield us. A lion among ladies is a most dreadful thing, for there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck, and he himself must speak through, saying thus, or to the same defect. Ladies, or fair ladies, I would entreat you not to fear, not to tremble. My life is yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a man as other men are. And there indeed let him name his name and tell them plainly he is Snug the Joiner. Well, it shall be so, but there is two hard things that is to bring the moonlight into the chamber. For you know, Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine that night we play our play? Yes, it doth shine that night. Why then may you leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play open, and the moon may shine in at the casement. Aye, or else one must come with a bush of thorns and a lantern, and he say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber. For you know, Pyramus and Thisbe, says the story, did talk through the chink of a wall. We can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall. Let him hold his fingers thus, and through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse your parts. with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door if we shadows have offended think but this and all is mended that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear and this weak and idle beam no more yielding but a dream gentles do not reprehend if you pardon we will mend and as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. Yeah.